I saw this and I thought, you know, tonight I'm going to share with you, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the King of Glory. Uh, I, don't, I haven't heard this preached too much, uh, but it just so kind of struck a note. Uh, and I, I've got to tell you, there's been, Kathy and I read several devotionals. And this is one of our devotion. I couldn't tell you who wrote the devotional. We read Joyce Myers. We read uh, Mark Batterson's. Uh, oh man, we've, we, we do the one that we give out. And, and sometimes we just, uh, I, I read a little bit of, uh, well, just whatever. We have about four of them on the table and we just kind of alternate. Sometimes we read two or three different ones. And, and, uh, but when I read this, this so inspired me. The King of Glory. And this was actually, uh, I don't know if some of you remember uh, one of our missionaries. Uh, is it, what's Davis's first name? I can't think of their names that we support. Anyway, he sends me a, a weekly devotional. Uh, I, and I emailed him back and I said, how many of these do you send out? And he said, I only send these to pastors. And uh, I said, wow, this was so good. That I said, and I emailed him back and I said, thank you. Uh, I said, next time you're in Springfield, if you will call me up, I will take you to lunch as a thank you for this because uh, he's written several that have just inspired me. But this one really hit me just really good. The King of Glory. Uh, I read this uh, other article that said, uh, a split personality is the cure. Some of you are thinking, oh, he's reading about himself. A small frame gentleman went into a psychologist and asked an unusual request. He asked the doctor if there was any way that his mind could be split into two personalities. <laughs> the doctor said, why on earth would you want such a thing? The man looking him right in the eye and making sure uh, they were by themselves, no one could hear it. He said, because I'm so lonely. So anyway, some of you that's just kind of soaking in. It's just kind of, some of you it's still going over, you know, but anyway. Psalms 24.10. This is David speaking, and we're going to go through the, the 24 Psalms tonight. As I read this, this just leaped out at me. And Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Selah. Now, when you... You know, when I read this, I thought, oh, there's a misprint. So I looked it up in another translation. And there was another misprint. And I looked it up in another translation. And they all had the same thing. It was a, you stop and think about, who is he? This king of glory. You can say that several different ways. It's like, it's like the, the Jewish man opened a dry cleaning store. And he put out on the front of the sign, it says, big sign there. And so a Scotchman came by and he looked at the sign and it says, my name is Fink. And what do you think? I do your clothes for nothing. Well, the Scotchman being a Scotchman, you know, boy, that's a good deal. So he went and got all of his clothes, brought them back, put them on the counter. And the guy said, you can be back tomorrow. So he went by to pick him up and he gave him a bill of 90 some dollars. And the Scotchman said, what? He said, no, no, I, I don't owe you a thing. Your sign on, on the outside. Come here, let me read your sign to you. Okay. So they went out and he's right there. It says, my name is Fink. And what do you think? I do your clothes for nothing. Well, the Jewish man says, oh, no, no, no. You read, you not read that right. He goes, my name is Fink. And what do you think? I do your clothes for nothing. It's all how you say it, isn't it? This scripture says, who is he, this king of glory? You ever found somebody that you weren't sure of who they were? And they say, well, who do you think you are? Come on. David's asking this question to himself. He's out there in the middle of the desert singing and doing what he did best, watching the sheep and all the things. And he says, who is he, this king of glory? It's the way you say it. Big question mark. And then he turns right around and answers it. He no sooner gets it out of his mouth than he answers it. The Lord of hosts. He is. Now we're, this is no longer a question mark. It's a statement. 
And, we, and we've got to grab hold of this as we go. Th- I've, I've read that. I'm emphasizing that because as we go through the 24th chapter, you're going to see exactly what David is thinking in this chapter. And, and it's a great chapter. He is the king of glory, Selah. Now, whenever you see Selah, it means several things. One of the meanings that I like is it means stop and think about these things. Pause and ponder, if you will. P and P, pause and ponder. That, uh, so David says, who is he? Notice the H in he is capitalized. Same as his name, God. Notice the K in king is capitalized. That tells you that he's of royalty. So you, if, you, if you take the caps off, then it means nothing. It's just another title, another position. But you put the caps on. This simply means we're going to pause and we're going to think about who is he, the king of glory? Let's look at this real close. The answer to this declaration of the majesty and sovereignty of God, it's the Lord Almighty, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is who he is, who he is. Now we have a hard time understanding infinity like, like he has always been. We, we, we have a date where we started, but we don't have a date where we end because we leave this earth and we just go on to heaven. And which we will catch up with a lot of loved ones. We really won't die. We just walk into the, to our eternal life. We go from earthly life to heavenly life. From, from our earthly being, human being life to heavenly beings. There is no death with us really. Other than our body is gone. But our spirit comes alive. So this, inver- this verse invites us to reflect on the, the greatness of who our God is. This is where David is heading. The, the title King of Glory signifies God's absolute authority as creator, as king. Not just any king, lowercase, but King of Kings, uppercase. I put a notation next to this. Lord Almighty further emphasizes he commands the angels of heaven are under his command. Now, I don't know if you've studied much in the command of heaven, the authority of heaven. Uh, John Bevere is a great theologian on this area. And I love to listen to John. He, he really gets, I've never met him. I'd, I'd love to meet him. Uh, I, I love his teaching if you ever want to just, but you can go to sleep easy with him. His voice stays the same. And, uh, but his, his stuff is so good. And he talks about the authority. He talks about the armies of heaven and that, that it's a militant setup. There, there's, there's generals and there's captains and there's sergeants, there's, you know, and, and it's, and God is, is the general of all of this. He's the one who commands it all into place. And I believe sometimes, uh, and this is not where I'm going tonight, but I think, I think the devil has copied that and he tries to do the same thing except for he's powerless. There's no power in his kingdom. It's a powerless kingdom. He's only a bluffer, an intimidator. Uh, when it comes right down to it, uh, you know, he, he doesn't know how to bluff very well either. But anyway, uh, so God is the ultimate power. Our daily lives, we have to recognize king of our life. This is where David is. Uh, it means giving reverence to him and honor 24-7. Not just Sunday morning. Every day. Every day. As, as we meditate on the King of Glory, who he is. Uh, I talked to someone just the other day, and they were talking about meditation. They, and I said, you know, meditation didn't start with Buddhism. I've got to tell you, it started with King David in the middle of sheep. <laughs> everywhere. And he learned to meditate. And that's where meditation started. Doesn't matter if you're sitting, standing, you can sit in any way you want. It's what you meditate on and how you meditate. Meditation is not new. It's not medieval. It started right out of the scriptures with King David many, many years before. And it will go on. So let's get going. Matthew five sixteen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. 
2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who commanded, there's that word commanded, the light to shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light. Right. Key words there, give the light. God has commanded. Who's he talking to? Us. We're to give the light. Of the knowledge of the what? Glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.15 says, that you may be blameless and harmless sons of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine as lights in the world. Wow. The glory of the Lord is in us. The Bible talks about that. I, I could found you 50 scriptures that state that. We sang about it tonight. So let's take it in bite-sized little pieces, shall we? Shall we go through each verse and just kind of go through it? If God truly is the Creator, as we believe, everything we see, feel, know, hear, taste, everything in His fullness is from God and it belongs to God. Everything good that we know came from God. We have to acknowledge that. We belong to God. I'll tell you the one thing that this book that we've been, we've been working on, on, on the, the healing, has, has brought me to a fuller re realization is the spoken word. We need to get back to the spoken word. I can remember my mother used to speak over whoever she prayed, and she would speak to the illness, speak to the sickness, speak to the demon, speak to it in the name of Jesus. And... and and our writer in the book, if you've noticed already, he talks about speaking to these things in the name of Jesus, speaking the word, the power in the word. Psalms 24, 1 through 10, we're going to go through it. The earth belongs to the Lord in his fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the floods. Wow. He's established this world. He spoke it into existence. I don't know. Kathy and I are having a hard time with what they're doing over here to our trees. <laughs> they're starting to clear it out. Uh, and they're wanting to do some other things. And, and we love the trees. When they cut out a section of it to, <laughs> for the, the, the electric lines, I, I almost moan because, I mean, it's just a big hunk. It's just gone. And now we see the gas station instead of trees. You know, it won't be long. We'll be seeing a lot more. But uh, we love the trees. And I thought, wow, God created these. And we love those kind of things. I shared this morning about the butterflies. That's part of God. Over, there's over, I, I forget how many species. What, what did she say? Over like oh, thousands of species of butterflies. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not even smart enough to create one species, let alone. <laughs> and some of them fly halfway around the world every year. That's, it's hard for me to believe a fluttering little butterfly that if you pick it up by its wings, you'll kill it because your finger, the oils on your finger will damage its wings where it can't fly. And yet it can fly in turbulence of 80 miles an hour. Oh, that's beyond me. Some of you need to go to the, to the butterfly palace and it just, it's fabulous. Even of us men can get into it a little bit there. We can do fine with it. Psalms 24, as I said, the earth belongs to the Lord. He has founded it on the seas, established it on the floods. The third verse says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart and has not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully. You can stand in God's presence today because he is your righteousness. Yes. I am not a righteous person. I know many of you think I'm perfect. <laughs> Leon, well, I saw that smirk. That was a, that was a smirk. That was, not, that was a smirk. But when we stand before God with a pure heart, then we stand righteous before him. If our hands are clean, then we stand before him. We are allowed to be in his presence. Church, that, that is a blessing. 
Never take that for granted. Verse 5 says, He will receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteous from the God of His salvation. Ryler preached a couple weeks ago on the blessing. That was a good... That, that was really good. I, I, don't, I enjoyed it. If you, if you weren't here, you can go back on... You can watch it on YouTube. It was the blessings of the Lord. Who receives the blessings of the Lord? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. That's the glory of the Lord in us. We don't have to be perfect. Praise God for that. But the minute you quit striving to be righteous, the minute you quit striving to be perfect, is the minute you go the wrong direction. A train that goes uphill is does fine unless it stops in the middle of the hill. And I learned that in Sydney. There was a small incline of less than 1%. And don't you know, at the very peak of that incline is where I had to cross with the bus. And sometimes, for some reason, the train would stop on the hill, which blocked my way of going across. And I'd have to go further down and around. But once it stopped, it was about 13 miles back to Sydney. And it almost had to back that whole distance to Sydney to get another run at the hill. It stopped on the hill, and it doesn't have the power to restart again on the hill. And I thought, how ridiculous. Most powerful thing in the world is that locomotive. Even only Superman's more powerful than me. <laughs> and it can't start on a hill? Less than a 1%? Oh, come on. And so one day there was, there was a man who attended our church, and he, uh, he had retired, and, he, and I asked him, I said, why cannot a, a train start on an incline? He said, because it has to have momentum. And once it has its momentum, it keeps going. Church, we have to have momentum. We receive the blessing. We can't stop. We can't go back. Verse 6 says this, This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Selah, there's that word Selah again. In other words, we should stop and think about this. Hmm. Those who seek Him. Let me ponder this for a moment. Am I seeking God? Am I doing my best? Am I, am I pushing forward? Or am I like that locomotive who, who stopped midway and can't get going again? It's got to back up and start all over. Wow. Heavy thoughts, aren't they? Lift up your hands, or your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory may enter. Wow. The doors and gates are a symbolism of our five senses, especially our eyes and our ears. Those are the main gates to our mind. About 70, I think 8% is what they're, they're saying now, of everything you know, what you've learned, has come from what you see and what you hear. Think about that. It's not what you've talked, not what you've tasted or, or felt. But it's through your, the portals of your eye, the doors of your eyes, and the doors of your ears. It's important. It's important. Allowing the king to enter and be king. Question. Who rules the throne of our hearts? Who sits on the royal chair of your life? It's a good question, isn't it? I'm, I'm going to read some definitions to you. The word definition, the definition to that... <laughs> is a statement of exact meaning of a word or a phrase, especially as a dictionary giving an exact statement or description of the nature, scope, or meaning of something. Bring clarity, explanation, expounding, illustrating, outlining of meaning. The word king, it means a whole lot different to us than it does to countries overseas that are ruled under a kingdom authority. A king is the ruler. <laughs> I mean, the ruler. He has the ability to have your head lobbed. He calls it, everybody does it. Complete control over his subjects. The word throne means it's a ceremonial chair of sovereign rulership or bishop. It's a symbol signifying the governing power and authority. Are you grabbing hold of that? Who sits on the throne of our heart? Who governs our heart, our life? Who is the authority in our life? Whew, this is where David's going. 
I mean, he, he's saying the king of glory. He's just not this, this big figure out here that just created everything and sits up there in a rocking chair thinking, wow, look what I've done. He's part of our life. It's relational. Aren't you glad you have a God that you, re- you can have a relationship with? Many, many men who claim to be gods are dead and still dead. But our Lord's alive and well. The word kingdom is a, it's a country, state, territory ruled by a king or queen that is under that reign or that rule. A dominion or providence under the control of a monarch. Now that monarch's not like a butterfly. Just thought I'd tell you that. Some of you are thinking about that. You're, you're soaking on that one. The word seek means to attempt, a desire to abstain or achieve something you want, need, or strive for. Wow. Pursue, quest, work towards, hunt for, make an appeal for, or aspire to. Just kind of making this scripture come alive a little bit more, a little bit more meaningful, a little bit more personal. And then he says again in verse 8, who is this king of glory? He's kind of hung up on this question. He keeps asking the question, but then he keeps answering his own question. Have you ever done that? It's dangerous if, if uh, they say, you know, if you answer your own questions that you could be in trouble. I don't know. Some of my answers may not be as good as my questions. I don't know. But here he goes. Who is the King of Lord? The Lord strong and mighty. Well, he's asking questions, giving answers. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads. There he goes again. Lift up your heads. Oh, you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, that the king of glory may enter. There must be something to do with these portals, these doors to our mind, to our heart. That David's thinking it's important that he says it. <laughs> I read this. The title of it was Life Strings Not Stringing You On. Life's order has been put into the following order. Apron strings, heart strings, purse strings, and harp strings. It got quiet. You're pondering that one. You're thinking that one through. Let me read it again. Life's order, life's order, progression, if you will, has been put in the following order. Apron strings. You ever, was you ever teased? Y'all, you know, you're tired of mom's apron, apron strings when you were a kid. Heart strings, purse strings, and last but not least, harp strings. I'm looking forward to those harp strings. I've never played the harp, but I think I might want to learn. I think I might want it. I want to sit down next to David and say, show me how to play that thing, will you? You know, uh, Note, mighty in battle is in reference to the purpose completed and finished. He's mighty in battle. Looking forward to the eternal reign and the final destruction of sin. You know, God is looking forward to that day. I don't understand this whole thing. I really don't. I don't understand why God just didn't make us all robots and we'll just automatically serve him and live the way we should. But that's not God's purpose. There's no relationship to a robot. If you don't believe me, just pull out your phone. You can ask Siri uh, about anything, but if you say, Siri, are, are you having a good day? She didn't know quite how to answer. Oh, you are. Oh, I'm happy to assist. Are you feeling happy? Wow. Yes, Siri, I am. I didn't get that. Can I, you try again? I know you didn't get it, but I'm not going to try again. There's no relationship with Siri. They're talking about AI. AI has only fed information it's given, and it gives you the answer from what has been fed. It can't give you anything more than what's already put in the computer banks, because it's AI. <laughs> if you want to have a good, intelligent conversation, you sit with a, a human being. And we learn from each other. We can learn from a computer, but it's not a relational thing. So who is this king of glory? <laughs> we go back to verse 10 again. The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory, Selah. I looked up what Selah meant, and it's got several meanings, and I thought all of them I need to share with you tonight. It's most commonly used at the end of a verse 
of Psalms in Habakkuk. It's a final thought for you to think over or meditate on. It's also used as a, a musical uh, distinction. And I, I didn't know this. This was kind of interesting. When used in a musical arrangement, it simply means not vocals during that interlude or bar. Music may come in higher or lower. It could be translated as meaning always or forever. It has an eternal value. And it's also used or mentioned 74 times in the book of Psalm in Habakkuk. So evidently it must be important that it's mentioned 74 times. If you read something once and you never read it again, it may not be significant, but when you see it over and over and over, it's like, look! You better take, pay close attention. So I say to you tonight, Selah. Let's pause and think. Who is the King of glory? Who is the King of glory? Amen. The Lord Almighty. He He's a strong tower. And all you have to do is you, you, you just need to go through the book of Psalms and read all the things that David portrays God as. And your, his job description is right there. Everything about God. David must have had that close relationship. Of course, he didn't have AI. and He didn't have Siri. He had to wing it, I guess, and just be one-on-one -on -one with God. But all the songs, a lot of the songs that we sing today, I'm sure the melodies are different. And the way they play it may be a little different, but we sing a lot of the book of Psalms in our worship. Who is the King of glory? <laughs> Who is the King of glory? The Lord God Almighty is He. <laughs> I remember a couple years ago, um, just maybe four or five. I was about 15. I had more than four or five. Kathy's holding on to 39, so maybe I could hang on to that too. I don't know. But I remember I had just given my heart to Jesus, really given my heart to God. I grew up in church. I, I could speak the language as good as anybody. I, I could... I could hang out with the best of them. And I really didn't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But when I went to camp, well, I was older than 15. I was, had to be around 16 or 17 between my junior and senior year. And the evangelist that night took special interest in me. I don't know why. I guess because I sat on the back row all through camp and was making more noise and honoriness. And God finally touched my heart and I and he sat down and he said, after we had prayed, I mean, it was like 2, 3 in the morning. And he said, Jim, who is Jesus to you? And I, I looked at him and his name was Bob Padgett. <laughs> Very gentle man. I imagine he's with his maker today. Such a godly man. I said, I don't know how to answer that. He said, you know, if I was around in 20, 30, 40 years from now, I would remember you. He had a fantastic memory. I, I, I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse, but he could remember people, their names, details. I, I'm lucky to remember my own name half the time, but anyway. But he said, if I was to be around you in another 20, 30, 40 years and ask you, who is Jesus to you? What would you say? Oh, I wish I could see Bob today. I wish I could just sit down I tell you who Jesus is because I've grown to know who God is. I didn't know that night. I had no clue. I didn't know how to answer him. I didn't know what to say. And he knew that. He knew that he was leaving an impression on me that would last a lifetime. And he said, I'm telling you right now, live for God as best you can with your whole heart, everything within you. I promised him, but most importantly, I promised God that night that I would. Or I should say that morning, 2, 3 in the morning. Who is God? Who is Jesus? He's everything. I can't even list. I could, we could, you know, uh, well, I made a list of about 
50,000 things. Do you want to want me to read them? Of course, you know I didn't make that kind of a list, but it could go on and on and on and on and on to list who is the King of glory? Who is the Lord Almighty? Is He? Wow. Thank you, David, for giving us the ultimate question, also giving us the ultimate answer. I was so blessed this morning. As Ryler and I were in the tank, I, I just smiled. I watched Ryler as he's helping me baptize everybody. And it was such a joy to be in there and see those kids be baptized. And, and it, it just, you know, Cecil, oh my goodness, he blessed me so much. Uh, you know, it, it just, wow. And, and I thought today, as I watched the whole thing back, I, usually I edit it and, and I have it out in an hour, but today, Kathy finally said, do you know what time it is? And I got here just about two seconds before Chuck and Dixie walked in the door. So I was, I mean, it was almost five and I, I, I was so blessed watching it and I watched and it so blessed me. You know what blesses me? When I see other people get the message and figure it out. And I'm seeing the whole McBride tribe figuring it out. That blesses me. What do you think, Rose? That bless you? I know it blesses you. She's been praying for those kids every waking moment of their lives. And it blesses me to start seeing it just snap and come together. And a little Alyssa, oh my goodness, not little Alyssa anymore. Bless me. Those things bless me to see people begin to grasp what it's all about. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. God, the question was asked by David, who is this king of glory? And then he, I don't even think there was even a period or a pause. I think he just went right into it. The Lord Almighty is he. Almighty, the word almighty means everything, all powerful. Nothing supersedes or trumps your power, God. You are the creator. You are God with a capital G. Nothing even comes close to you. God, may we, every day of our life, no matter how old we are, may we understand the greater value each day of who you are to us. As we go through our problems and situations and issues, God, you become even more real because our dependency is on you. As we go through victories, we celebrate in it. And all of a sudden, we're, we're joyful and we're excited because we've gotten victory. Lord, you're our all in all in everything. Ups, the downs, the good, the bad. So Lord, help us to always celebrate you and who you are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name. Praise your name. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, challenge to you, let's spend some time around the altars. And you tell God some of the awesome things He's done for you. And also, you know, if you spend 10 minutes here at the altar, spend five minutes talking to Him, and spend five, to- five minutes listening to Him. God, you're, you're so good. We, we love you, Lord. Talk to me, speak to my heart. And let Him tell you how awesome you are. Sometimes we forget. Some of us have guilt when it comes to that. But let me tell you, God wants you to know He loves you and He thinks you're awesome. He loves you. He's the big daddy who would do anything for his kids. Don't mess with my kids. He loves you. Let Him tell you. Let Him surround your your very being with His love. Let Him just, just close in with Him tonight. Usually I, I, I tell you to pray for revival. And tonight I want you to just be a little selfish in your prayer. Say, God, I just, I just want to feel your presence a little bit more tonight. I want to draw a little closer. I want to lay my head on your chest and feel your heartbeat. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I have a couple different times. There's something about feeling and hearing that heartbeat that brings peace. And when you feel God's heartbeat, Oh my goodness. It just kind of pulls you in. So allow God just to pull you in tonight. 
Who is the King of glory? Well, you finish the sentence tonight as you pray. You don't take David's word for it. You finish it.